Please welcome Bruce Davey. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, so I don't want to take away too much time from the, uh, the speakers, but just wanted to say uh, you know, the, the, the next session we're going to do here is very much following on from Rajiv's comments. It's the, the rise of software in, in, uh, in networking. And I just want to tell a quick story about, um, I, so I'm one of those old people that Rajiv was referring to has been in doing networking for 30 years. And um, back in the 80s, I collaborated with some folks at MIT who um, actually strongly argued that networking should be, should be a, a software-based business and did a project that was, and, and their final paper on this project was called Software Strikes Back. And I think it's just amazing to see like from that, that vision that was pushed by, forward by academics in the 80s, we now see how much it's becoming a reality today. So the, the next three talks are going to kind of address the, the rise of software and networking. And so without further ado, I want to invite up to the stage uh, Brendan Blanco from, uh, from VMware, um, who I think of as Mr. BPF, to talk about some of the experiences he's had in software networking. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak at FutureNet. Uh, so far, I'm having a, a great time, uh, a lot of good talks, and I hope there are some, some more good talks today. And uh, part of what we've seen so far is about uh, some people theorizing how we should look at networks um, with the, you know, look at intent, uh, and uh, other people looking at how to consume networks uh, from the point of view of a, a user. Now, I'm going to look at networks from the point of view of a developer. So I've been a software engineer, uh, and uh, I'd like to share some of my experiences and some of the, the growth uh, of the industry from, from my perspective. So once upon a time, uh, a new grad joined a, a big networking company. I won't say which one. Uh, but the life of There we go. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the life of a software engineer uh, at uh, big, software, uh, big networking companies uh, back in 2006 was monolithic. Uh, the, you know, there's a, I was a, on a small team of 250 people. Uh, we had you know, two-year release cycles. And um, the, like, we had this mentality of being trapped into the networking hardware that we had to operate on. And the next innovation was going to come with the, the next piece of hardware. Um, at that point, we're looking at some, um, a little bit of the, the you know, programmable chips with uh, uh, Cavium uh, Octeons and things like that. Um, but we're mainly competing on performance and losing to our competitors on uh, it being inflexible. Um, and there's no open source. And um, so there's you know, a lot of line cards, a lot of ASICs. And uh, everyone was talking about the next firmware upgrade and three-year uh, three refresh cycles. And you know, innovations came from the intelligent core uh, and you know, big power-sucking boxes. And um, like we saw, like, there's a whole bunch of problems around you know, the CLI-driven networking and the you know, change order processes and so on. So you know, everything is big and slow-moving, uh, very complicated. This sucks. Um, now, something's starting to germinate in the industry. We have uh, virtual machines becoming a thing. So vSphere at that point is uh, you know, starting to grow. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one of the, just two months after I joined, I, I looked back at the timeline, it was kind of, kind of interesting, it was uh, this little thing called uh, EC2. It was just entering beta in August of 2006. You might have heard of it. Um, so this is all happening. This kind of sets the context for um, where networking is, and from the point of view of a software developer, um, you can see something that's, that's going to change. And uh, let's, let's see how that, that goes. So uh, let's fast forward a few years, and uh, you know, things have, have grown up a little bit. So that, that seed is now um, uh, a bit more uh, important to the industry. Um, so the, the application developer has their, um, is a little bit more empowered to drive the conversation about how, you know, how to develop apps, what infrastructure they need. Um, it's all about you know, cloud, a little bit about how to work with the enterprise and, and bridging that gap. Um, and you know, DevOps is the, you know, the, the key way to um, automate how you're, how you're you know, building your software. 
So the public cloud is putting pressure on private cloud. And so in the industry that, that um, I was looking at, we we're seeing you know, the rise of you know, private clouds through you know, vSphere, CloudStack, OpenStack. Some of these have, have come, and, come and gone. And the question that people were asking was, you know, how do you take these networks that we have and bolt something on top that's scalable? Uh, and so we've seen like, some of the, the tension um, from you know, the people that are thinking about how to operate these networks. Uh, we, we, we talked about that yesterday. Um, but from my point of view, uh, as a, a software engineer, I'm you know, interested not in how to control that networking equipment, but how to build the next, level, you know, the next generation of software that can um, work natively within that cloud environment. So how to build these new network functions in a, a scalable way. And there's a, a bunch of new technologies that start to come around. So you know, let's see, you know, there's encapsulation protocols you know, uh, coming out of uh, various protocol organizations. And um, you know, some of these are, are driving new ways of you know, providing overlay networks and you know, trying to figure out how you know, different, uh, different ways to control those networks. You have OpenFlow. You have um, different incarnations of that. You know, there's open source versions of OBS. Uh, and there's you know, different ways of looking at you know, flow base versus um, uh, state distribution and contrail and things like that. Um, and of course, you have the big players putting out their, their version of it. Um, and the, the one other thing here, IOVisor is something that, that we brought along that's, that's now turning out to be um, kind of a, a nice widespread uh, technology to build upon. Um, but so these are all choices that we have as a software engineer you have to look at and try to see how to, to build on top of this. Um, but we haven't really looked at the problem yet to see how, uh, what, what's the right way to build it. So you have... Uh, this kind of centralized um, infrastructure that you want to move into a distributed infrastructure. And so you want to bring software to, to the equation. But th so that means programming. But programming what? Is it uh, building flows? Like, is, are we just going to program the, you know, the controller to steer the network everywhere and, and just connect things a little bit better? Uh, how do we turn those flows into APIs? Is may maybe if everything's an API, then everything's going to be magically better. Or to take those, those APIs and turn them into you know, new high-level language descriptions of how everything should interconnect. Um, so th these are all questions, and there's, there's a hint of where things are going, but uh, from a software engineer, it's, it's not clear um, how, to, how to tackle this. So um, I did what uh, all uh, engineers do um, someday. I, uh, I joined a startup, uh, so kind of growing up a little bit. And uh, the startup had the goal of uh, building a framework to um, bring this programmability uh, in, out, to, uh, out to networking in a distributed way. Um, so we, we saw a few, few key things, which is that the, the hypervisor is this place where you can inject a, you know, a substrate to be able to um, build new functionality. And that functionality doesn't necessarily have to be uh, you know, designed ahead of time. We can you know, figure out how the problem is going to evolve and put the, the code in there. So it should, it should be very flexible. Um, and it also needs to be fast. So you know, when you're building networks, you need a dependable you know, execution environment. So ASICs are, are good for that. Um, but if you're going to do this in software, what's, a, what's an ex uh, execution environment that, um, that you, can, you can run in? So we have... You know, th things like the Linux kernel, which are, you know, a nice, uh, you know, uh, strong platform. Um, but there is, you know, it's um, kind of a, a hard environment to get into. You have to become a kernel developer. You have to start to contribute upstream patches and, and go through a rigorous process. So we want to be able to change this industry, but um, there is a lot of resistance along the way. And you want to be able to do this in a way that's very um, uh, agile. So um, there's a lot of details along what we did at that startup. Um, and one, one thing that I want to uh, take out of that and, and tell you about is, uh, and dive a little bit deeper into, is a, a set of uh, software and infrastructure that uh, allows network developers and infrastructure developers to get some of the benefits that the application 
uh, layer folks uh, already are taking advantage of. So you have something like Node.js, which uh, lets you build kind of ad hoc um, applications. You don't have to worry about any layers underneath. There's nice abstraction layers. Uh, and we want to bring that to, um, to the, the data plane layers. And so uh, as part of the startup, we, we take that, you know, creating an open source core uh, idea and um, you know, bought, uh, uh, found other people that had similar mindsets and created a community out of that. Um, and iAvisor is the, the Linux, uh, Linux Foundation project that, that we're um, still contributing to and, and something that I'm still active in um, that's uh, kind of the, the long-lasting value of, of that, that journey that we've come through. And there are a few technologies that are part of that. So eBPF, uh, extended BPF, is um, the core kernel component that, uh, that, that we've upstream. It's available for you to use um, that you can uh, program in kind of a high-level language and, and uh, push that into your kernel and, and run things safely. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. There's also um, interesting things related to analytics, uh, monitoring, and um, another technology that, that's very um, applicable to this crowd is, is XDP, which I'll also touch on. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about BPF. So um, you know, who, who knew, here knows what BPF is? OK, who here knows uh, what TCB dump is? OK, so you know what BPF is. BPF, uh, there, there, so if you didn't see, there are more people that raise their hand for TCP dump which uh, if you've ever tried to debug a network, you've used it. Uh, BPF is the, the, the piece that's in the kernel that makes that go fast. So it started off as this um, kind of a, a, a little uh, kind of scripting and assembly language that runs inside the kernel. And uh, as, as part of the, the startup I was at, PlumGrid, we uh, took that and extended it to kind of turn it into a more full-fledged uh, in-kernel virtual machine. Um, and here I mean virtual machine in the sense of like the Java virtual machine, not, not um, you know, the VMware virtual machine. And that, that environment that's there in the kernel, that engine, um, lets you uh, put code, you know, write code with a tool chain. You have, you know, we can write in C and you have this LLVM pipeline um, that, you can, uh, that you can code in, um, insert into the kernel. Uh, the kernel will uh, verify the code that you've, that you've added is safe to run. You don't have any um, uh, infinite loops. Uh, you'll have a, a, you know, a predictable execution time, um, which is important for, for high-speed networking, for instance. Uh, and uh, you have different primitives like uh, hash tables, arrays, LPM tables. Um, and uh, you have a, an API between user space and kernel space to be able to, uh, to, to share data back and forth and to drive the, the state machine of your um, your data plane that's, that's in the kernel, your you know, analytics function that's in the kernel. And then the kernel uh, will let you take those, those functions that you've written and uh, attach them to different uh, interesting events within, uh, uh, within the operating system. And um, so this is kind of the, the framework. You, it's uh, not very prescriptive in terms of what you can do with it. Like you, There are lots of um, helper functions that you can use. There's lots of uh, attachment points and the the code that's that that you get to run is actually up to you, um, as opposed to uh, other uh, you know other pieces of the kernel which are um, you have you know fixed APIs um, like IP tables or, or things like that which you have to um, uh, program in a, a specific way. Um, so this is pretty free form uh, comparatively. Um, and so one example of a an attachment point. Uh, that's that's pretty interesting. Is this thing called uh, uh, XDP? So XDP is a, a, an effort um, in the kernel to uh, speed up the the per packet processing um, of the Linux stack. Linux is uh, typically uh, good at doing things like uh, TCP and having you know uh, scalable uh, multiprocessing on the user space side. Uh, but when it comes to per packet performance, it's typically lagged behind. Um, and with a programmable element that you can put close to the driver and be able to run arbitrary uh, code uh, gives you a potential for a very high level of scalability in terms of throughput. And so this is a little bit of an architecture diagram of the model of where you run BPF programs. So this is the, the red box at the bottom. And packets come from the network. And you can do things with them. You can forward them. You can inspect them. You can uh, mutate the packets. You can do lookups in your tables. Um, you can send events to user space. 
uh, and you can you know, drop packets. So anything that a you know, networking data plane would typically do. And uh, this, this is a, a, a powerful, um, powerful primitive to use. And actually, um, the, the, there, there are a couple projects that, that are using this uh, to, to create new innovations. So uh, assuming you have this programming model uh, and you know, kernel hook points and um, a high-speed uh, data plane to interact with, uh, and uh, you want to build an application on top of this, uh, how do you build that? Well, you can actually compose these BPF functions in the kernel and uh, stitch them together and actually build a pipeline of uh, different programs. Uh, and you can um, you know, think of building min uh, little mini networks inside your kernel. In fact, we've used this to, you know, with you know, thousands of BPF programs together, um, tens of thousands, you can, um, you can create a very lightweight, um, you know, lightweight environment that, uh, that lets you do lots of things. And uh, so this is a, where, a bit of where things are going with BPF and the, the model that we think you should you know, consider when, when building new applications as a developer. So um, after we've kind of created this, this infrastructure, uh, then the life of a software developer now is, is um, you know, much, much nicer. Um, you don't have monolithic builds. In fact, you can, um, with a, a handful of engineers, you can build, you know, the, here's a list of all of the things that we built. Um, and just in a couple years' time, uh, and you can run these um, in a, you know, inside this, this environment. And uh, it really shortens the, the, the life cycle. For instance, um, now we have environments where you can simulate a full customer uh, a deployment, you know, multiple racks of, of equipment with uh, you know, simulations of virtual machines and containers and all the different workloads interacting in a, a real-time environment. And you don't have the problem of if you have you know, all the, the test matrix as, you, as it grows, um, you don't have to wait longer and longer to wait for you know, your test bed hardware. You can run this all in the cloud and you can take um, take the product that you've built on this and run it at scale and kind of uh, you know, eating your own dog food. So it's now created uh, Jenkins for your, for your network operating system. Um, I think that, that was uh, one of the presenters yesterday had a you know, criticism that, that this is hard in networking. In fact, I think it's, it's getting easier. Um, so life for a software engineer has improved, but the, the world never stays still. Um, so we worked on, on an OpenStack plugin, but then you know, th containers came along. Um, now there's function as a service, so, so who knows what's, what's next. Um, but I'm not worried about that, because the platform that we built is it's an open source platform. It's built on Linux. It has you know, dependable components um, that have you know, live eyeballs looking at them, a lot of people using them, and it's uh, available upstream. You can uh, use it and play with it, and um, it's, not going in a, it's not going away. So if you know, someone comes up to me and asks me, well, what do, you, what do you see next? This is, again, it's future net, not past net. And um, I see that this transition to software, you know, as the pendulum goes back and forth, you know, we, we've seen the software side. Um, and one, one um, kind of fork is going to be to let's look at the performance side again. Uh, let's bring the, the performance of these, um, these programmable networks up to the next level. You know, 100 gigabit is here, and it's, it's spreading. Um, you have you know, right, uh, falling prices of, of Flash, and PCI Gen 4 is coming. So the, um, the, the I.O. layer needs to, needs to keep up. So you know, HPC converging that with you know, data center deployments, um, NFE, and like, how do we make that more flexible and more performant? And... Um, Doing all that while using you know, open open platforms to create um, and you know an ecosystem of of uh, new functionality. Um, and another and another avenue we have you know new platforms um, that you know cloud native, cross cloud, uh, containers and, and functions and and how to distribute security and all that. So these are you know a multitude of things. Um, but there are common elements, and um, I'd like to see the, uh, BPF and the technologies around that be used as one of the kind of the glue that, that ties all these things together. We shouldn't have to have vendor-specific um, solutions that only work on a particular hardware when our hardware is, in fact, a cloud and an API. 
Um, so we need solutions that, that can bridge that gap um, and can work all the way from, from your, your hardware smart NICs up to, uh, up to, the, uh, up to the cloud, uh, cloud models. And so um, in closing, I just want to um, maybe give you a homework assignment or, or talk about something that um, I did on a weekend using the, the, the technology that we have. So um, it's, it's not necessarily clear what, what I'm showing here, so I'll talk about it. So there's a, a lot of potential with XDP and BPF um, as a specific case. And uh, here I'm, sh I'm showing a graph of what it's like to run a DDoS filter in Linux before and after using XDP. So we have, um, you know, at, at the left hand, it's, it's almost uh, completely down on the Y scale. Uh, it's, you know, a, a few hundred uh, um, thousand packets per second that you're able to filter um, with a single core. And adding XDP, uh, putting a, a programmable hook at the right point, we're able to do line rate on a, um, actually th this is a, um, almost line rate on a 40 gig NIC, uh, about half a line rate, uh, on a 40 gig NIC with a single core um, with a, a programmable filter. So I, I have a Python script that I, that I wrote and um, when able to do a, a, a filter with XDP and you can change it on the fly and, and go from you know, a few hundred K a DDoS filter to line rate DDoS filter. So th the tools to do this are open source. Um, you can you know, Google some of the, these terms, you know, iVisor, uh, BPF, XDP, and see some of the other people that are doing this. You know, take it to your test bed and, and try to uh, you know, write something new. Thank you.